Thanks, Greg. Good afternoon, everybody. And thanks, uh, Liz and Robin, for the testimonies. Um, we're going to turn straight to our Bible, and we're going to go to John chapter 3. So today's talk is um, the, the miracle of repentance. Okay, the miracle of repentance. As Greg has already highlighted in our testimonies as well, uh, behind the curtain here is a baptism tank that um, we're going to have a baptism already this afternoon. So if there's anybody else who would like to be baptised, uh, we're happy to do that and to see you fulfil what may have been a long journey for you where repentance might have started a week ago, it might have started a year ago. The word repentance means to sincerely regret or remorse in your heart, to turn to God. It's a change of mind, a change of heart and a change of action to turn away from sin and return to God. And the word sin we can't really use much these days. It's a bad word. Uh, people don't like us using the word sin, but sin has destroyed your life. Disobedience or wickedness um, that God describes that we, all, we, we were all doing before we came along to the Lord. And, and maybe we need a repentant heart by someone telling us what it is to follow God and the moment we hear from somebody as we've already heard uh, Robin was mentioning the, the fishermen and Liz up at Elizabeth that someone came and identified in their lives the need to repent that our lives your life and my life needed repentance and as in this room there would be not one single person who could testify of the miracle of repentance by way of int being introduced to God if someone had not told them the salvation of Jesus Christ if Jesus Christ had never been mentioned to you or to me then we would never had that demarcation line that that paralleled world to compare the life that we were living to the life that we were being told God wanted us to have. And as we went through from hearing, in my case, I heard the word of God, and then a little while later, I finally came to the Lord, but it just seemed that when I first heard the word, that the guy that told me about his life had changed dramatically. And there was a number of, about a year later, that I myself came along, but in that, between that period, I went hitchhiking up along the east coast and down towards, um, uh, in it towards Yass and all the way back into South Australia. Along the way, I had everything that you would ever want as an unsaved person wanting to get some sort of, sort of fulfilment out of life. And it just seemed that, this is my story now, that in hearing what God was offering and then being brought into a repentant thought process of a change of of heart, an action, and a change of mind, that whatever I would do in the quietness of the night, it just seemed like the Lord was talking to my, my mind or my being or my soul that, well, you've done that. How does that compare to what I'm offering you in the way of what, what I've seen happen in this person's life? And eventually, that repentant mind, where God was working on my life and worked on, has worked on your life, got me baptised down at Karakalinga many years ago and, and in the same way we, there are people that have had really bad lives, no doubt about it, they've had terrible lives and they've searched Liz mentioning a little about her testimony here today and that search to try to find something good out of this life something of purpose that can resonate in that person's soul or that that, that change of life that leads to being at peace with yourself and, and that, that helps us with repentance. So repentance is a miracle by which the Lord uses the changing of our mind and our heart to bring us closer to God. Without repentance if we go back to one step when Jesus first came on the scene after being baptised he said repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And we have uh, many stories here this afternoon of the lives of people's changed life. And where they don't want to talk about the life they had before, the damage, the ruination that they had in their life 
and maybe the lives that they've damaged as well. There are people that have caused bad lives to others. There are people that have lived a terrible life and they've damaged other people's lives along the way. And they've repented. They've felt remorseful and they've regretted damaging different people's lives. It might have been a partner, husband, wife, or your children, or um, people that you've known, where you've actually damaged someone else's life by your own attitude and the conduct of life, which we all have done. And then there's people that have done it to us, where they've treated us badly, and it's damaged our life. Psychologically, mentally, it's caused a scar in our soul and in our heart that it's just hard to, to remove and flick away out of our life. And we live with it until we hear repentance, the miracle of life-changing experience of receiving the Holy Ghost and getting baptised. And that's our story today, isn't it? That we can talk, talk to people about in, in, the, in the two ways. Jesus said, none were right. It's no, not one. All, all of the sin and come short of the glory of God. We can talk from the aspect of, I actually damage other people's lives. But the Lord changed my life. And we can talk about from the aspect of, I've been damaged by how people have treated me. And I can tell you how I've been healed, set free and liberated from the bondage of that entrapment that once beset my life and soul. I've now been liberated. We can talk on the two fronts. And it starts with repentance. It's just repeating again. It means to regret, to be sincerely remorseful, to turn to God. It's a change of mind, of heart, of action, and to turn from sin toward God. That's what repentance means in our term. We go to John chapter 3, as I'm not there yet. John 3. And then Jesus starts to say, verse 16, one of the great verses of the Bible, For God so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten Son, that whoever, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn it, to punish it, to uh, damn it, to call into question, to judge it by the law of the Old Testament. He didn't come to do that, but he said he, he came, but, for the, but the world through him might be saved. Verse 18, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God, Jesus Christ. So we hear the message of salvation, and we have a choice to reject it or to accept it in our life. Let's go to um, John chapter 15. John 15. And Jesus went on further to say to John, John's writing here, verse, chapter 15, verse 26. But the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceeds from the Father, he shall testify of me, and you shall be bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning, talking to the disciples, that they were going to bear witness. And Peter, in one of his first sermons, if you like, said to the people that were listening, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of the sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So repentance is as alive today, as what it was when Jesus first started his ministry. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And if we go to John in chapter 17, verse 20, this is one of Jesus, he's at the end of his ministry, he's about to face the cross, the crucifixion, and he says here in the garden, verse 20, neither pray I for these alone, this is Jesus' prayer to God. But for them also which shall believe on me through their words, which ones will come after, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in you, that they also may be one with us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. And down in verse 26, I have declared unto them thy name and will declare it that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. So this repentance is being motivated by this God so loved the world. 
that he gave us his son, his amazing son, to live his life and to teach about the miracles of the kingdom of God and how that we are now set free. We've got a, a fantastic life. As hard as what it may be, I think Robin was saying uh, some of the difficulties that she had, the ups and downs, and Liz said the self-tribulation. And we've all had diff difficulties come in our walk in the Lord, but the life that we've got through repentance and finding out how much Jesus Christ is working in our life can't be compared to the life that we would have had if we'd never heard the gospel of salvation. If we'd lived our life and never known God, where would we be today? If Jesus Christ had never come into your life, if you'd never met Jesus, if you'd never been taught about repentance, about how you need to change your life, yes, you need to move away from sin, how that sin is destroying your life. And that is a challenge because you've got to, be, you've got to fight that and you know, it gets right to the core of your being. And moving back toward God, if we had never heard the word of truth, this room would be utterly empty. There would be not one person in this room here this afternoon if someone had not set, stepped out and thought, I'm going to talk to that guy, that girl, and tell them the way, of, the way it is in their life. I'm going, to, I'm going to pray tonight that the Lord will give me an opportunity to speak to that person and maybe the days and the weeks and the months might have gone by and then one day someone spoke to us about repentance, about needing our life to be changed. Let's have a look at the story in the Old Testament, shall we? Going right back to the book of Jonah. Good old Jonah. Jonah, the word of the Lord, verse 1. Came unto Jonah, the son of Hamiti. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee from Tarshish, from the presence of the Lord. We're now in Jonah chapter 1, verse 3. And went down to Joppa. He found a ship going to Tarshish. He paid the fare thereof. He went down into it to go with them into Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea. And there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God and uh, cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten the load and to lighten it up. But Jonah was going down to the side of the ship and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon the name of God, and if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. And he said unto every one of the fellows, Come, let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. Then they cast their lot, and the lot fell upon Jonah. And then they said unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause is evil upon us? What is thine occupation? Whence comest thou? We're talking about repentance. What is thy country, and of what people art thou? And then he said unto them, I am a Hebrew. I fear God, the God of heaven, which has made the sea and the dry land. It's sort of like, uh-oh, we've got a Hebrew in our midst. We've got a guy who's running away from God. He's gone the opposite way to repentance. And God is actually wanting him to go to a city that he believes is repenting of the sin, cry against Nineveh, 120,000 souls. Now, he's gone from being a prophet of God, and he, he lived in a time... When Israel was divided, there was the, the, the Judah and Israel. He lived in a time when the king did that which was evil. He lived in a time when Israel was almost wiped out and God had pity upon Israel at the time. According to the prophet Jonah, we can read in, in Kings. So he's in a really bad place. He's got to prophesy bad things. He's where the nation is about to go. And then he gets told, go to Nineveh, go to the Gentiles and tell them they need to repent. God's, God's upset with you. So he goes to Tarshish, which is a conjecture about exactly where that is, but it's completely in the opposite direction. The mariners are there. It's a trade route. They've got cargo. These are experienced sailors going, in the, going about their business just as it is. But God was merciful in this story 
because um, Jonah goes from, first of all, with Jonah, he goes from being this prophet of God to a Waco sleeper. Now, in war, just recently I was reading about a New Zealander, talking about our sister Liz from New Zealand, a guy from Palmerston in New Zealand, Jack Dunn, in World War I, went out to Gallipoli as a young man, fought in Gallipoli, got it injured, sent to the Isle of Lemos for recovery and surgery, re-enlisted to go back onto the front lines because he wanted to be with his men, gets injured again and gets put on sentry duty. Don't fall asleep. Look out for your fellow soldier on the front lines. An officer came along and found him asleep. And he was court-martialed and sentenced to death because he fell asleep in sentry without guarding his fellow soldier. Because of his character and his reputation as being a fine, incredible, decent human being, on appeal, he was given 10 years hard labor if he went on the front lines and fought. He fought and died in battle a couple of weeks later. The severity of falling asleep when you're on duty is not to be underestimated when you see what happens in you know, battle. So then they've gone, just reason they've re-looked re at his whole life and, and he was in terrible pain and he should never have been put on the sentry but that's what happened back then. So falling asleep when you're driving, not a good move is it? You can be as Christian as you like, but if you fall asleep when you're driving, look out. Um, falling asleep on doing, using machinery, or you can put it wherever you like it in your life. So here's this man of God who's got all the answers. He's gone down to the basement of the ship and he's fast asleep. What drove through his mind to, to get, go from that to that? We could look and we could read and do a whole study on that. But the Lord used this situation to get at the mariners. Who, if we read there in verse, um, he's talking about going to the gods, small g. And everybody on that ship was now turning to their little gods, and nothing had changed. Then the mariner, the shipmaster particularly, says, Call upon your God. Capital G that says there in verse, toward the end of verse 6, if so be that God, capital God, the real God, will think upon us that we perish not. And then Jonah gets thrown into the water because that's what they figured needed to be done. Jonah said, cast me into the water and the, the waters will cease. And so they did that. They, verse 15 so they took up Jonah, cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly. They're now in contact with God now and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made a vow. They repented very quickly because they didn't want to kill one of God's people. And now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So the mariners were spared. And the people on that boat came into contact of repentance, even though Joan himself hadn't quite um, fulfilled what God wanted him to do. Now, well, there's not too many people that have survived living in a, a big belly of a whale for, for, for long. I think there's about two rec recorded cases. One, a guy by the name of James Bardley, who spent three days or three nights in, the, in a belly of a whale back in 1891. And um, he was bleached white, and he lived out his life in a pretty bad state mentally. And then just recently, there was a Spanish guy, Luigi, got spat out by a whale. Well, that might make sense because he was a Spaniard. He probably didn't taste very nice, I don't know. <laughs> but the Spaniard, he might have had a good taste when I think about it, but out of you go. He came out and um, he described the stench of being inside the belly of a whale. Um, it's not something that you really want to look forward to experience in your life. But he was put there to learn a lesson of repentance in the bad way. Um, and you know, you've got all sorts of stories that get around of people that have been swallowed up and 
in alive. I just sort of think about it this morning about when you get on these big storms. When we were living in London, we'd go over to Holland for the uh, their camp at this at Christmas time, and there'd be some terrible waves going across the the North Sea. Really quite frightening. Would just be you'd be almost wondering whether you're going to get to the other side. Um, and then there was Jaws. Remember Jaws? It just ruined all my surf days and my swimming. It, I, I can still hear it now mentally. <laughs> well, I used to swim out for miles before that. With all my brothers, we'd go out, see how far we could go out. That all changed. Then you'd see a, a seaweed would run past you, leave. <laughs> oh, it's a shark. I'm going to be bitten. So, um, you know, th- here's three days, three nights in the belly of a whale. And Jesus will refer to this later, but if you look in verse 1 of chapter 2, Jonah prayed to the Lord there. I was just remembering Pastor Brian Smith, which is a little while ago over in New Zealand. He was struck down with cancer. And he was on the, on his, at his home, he's on the couch. He's completely, has got no energy at all. This is his description. I can't even lift my head off the pillow. Um, and I'm in a dark place because I'm feeling for my wife Kay. He's, she's just doing everything. And I can't do anything. He's the pastor of the church over there. And he's condemning himself in a way because he felt like, oh, you know, I should be more, more victory because I'm man of God sort of thing. So while he's lying on this couch... And he's in a dark place emotionally, mentally, spiritually. He's just trying to look to the Lord and get something from God. And he hears this little tiny voice that says, yeah, but I was there, because he was thinking about Jonah, being in the, how dark it was for Jonah, Pastor Brian. And then he hears this overriding thought in, in his mind, yes, but I was there. And he opens up his eyes and he thinks, oh, of course. And from that moment on, he got better and better and better and better. He came here to thank the saints. Because I mentioned that we were on our, when we were praying before COVID, we'd have our 10-minute praying. And he was in our prayer time there for a number of weeks, if we remember. And then we hear about um, Ronnie and Roger going over to New Zealand. And there's some troubles in the family. Is that right, Bronnie? And then Brian Smith has no idea. This is before he was sick. So going back, so he meets them. They're just travelling around. He engages in the in the with the family, the kids, etc. It's a life-changing moment for the family. Correct, Bronnie? Then Bronnie hears about (coughs) Pastor Brian being sick, and she has a prayer and fast for Pastor Brian that he gets better. Is that right? Tell me if I get it wrong. (laughs) Well, Pastor Brian has found out that Bronnie's not too well at the moment either. She's got a, a, a compromised health. And guess what he's doing? Praying and fasting for you. So we live in this sort of world of amazing repentance. It doesn't just stop with... It, it rolls on. It rolls on through people's lives. It rolls on in our life. And it rolls on into... Really? Well, I don't know what God did to me. When I repented, he healed me. And now I'm going to do the same for you. I'm going to pray. And, and we live in this constant world of repentance, what we're calling it today, the miracle of repentance. Now Jonah, he got himself right, he sorted it all out, and 120,000 people turned back, or turned to God. If we go to chapter th- chapter 4, sorry, not chapter 4, chapter 3, and verse 8. But let, let, when he goes, finally gets to Nineveh, second time, he finally does when he gets delivered a second chance. So Jonah goes to Nineveh and then he warns them that the Lord is going to destroy the place and the king and everybody hears about it. They believe. They repent. Verse 8, But let every man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way. This is repentance at its best. And from the violence that is in their hands, who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works, they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil 
that he had said he would do unto them and he did it not. We heard from Ramundo very well on Wednesday night of how amazing evil and good and how that was explained on Wednesday night. It's good to listen to it if you haven't, haven't heard yet. So God acknowledged their repentance and there was 120,000 souls in that city, Gentile city, weren't with Israel and he, he heard them and we were Gentiles. We were in our world doing our thing. They weren't God's people. We called out to God or someone told us and then along came the message or in other times we didn't call out to God but the message went to us and then we repented and turned our way. But either way we've had people come to us and that's why we have the fellowship that we have today because people have done that. Let's go, we won't go the rest about Jonah, let's go to Acts in chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. Better get myself a bit of water here, sorry. I was going to drink up from Pastor Paul's last week, but I might start singing, you never know. Did you see the big panda bear last night? <laughs> the giant? It was very good, wasn't it? He got geared on by Joel and Mitch. Uh, chapter 10. So here, Cornelius, this is from Caesarea, he's an Italian, he's from the band of called Italian, a devout man, one who fears God, he uh, in his, gives arms to his people, verse 2, and prayed unto God always. And he saw a vision, uh, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel coming unto him and saying unto Cornelius, and when he looked on him, he, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine arms have come up for a memorial up before God. Now send men to Joppa and call one Simon, whose surname is Peter. So he's called to Joppa. He gets there and he, he talks to, to, gets told to talk to Peter. Verse 7, just for the time. And when the angel which spoke unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited for him continually. And when he had declared all the things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. And on the morrow as they went their journey, they drew nigh into the city, and Peter went up about to the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Peter begot, got very hungry, verse 10. He was in a trance, and in verse 11 he saw heaven opened, and a certain vessel was descending unto him as it had been a great sheet of knit of the four quarters and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And then came to a voice saying, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I've never eaten anything that is common or unclean. This is to do with the food laws. He was an Israelite and he had certain food laws to live by, but the Gentiles didn't, the non-Israelites. Then, uh, and then the voice spoke unto him a second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not common. And this was done three times. Now while Peter, verse 17, was doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen meant should mean, behold, uh, the men that were sent from Cornelius made inquiry of Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon, which surname was Peter, lodged there. And while Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise, go down to them, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men that were sent from, from Cornelius and said, Behold, I am he whom you seek, for what is the cause wherefore you are come? Very similar story to what we saw in Joppa, where right back in, uh, uh, Jonah goes to Joppa, to go to Tarshish to flee from the presence of the Lord but the Lord had a plan for the mariners and he had a plan for the, ne uh, the Nevite people people from, from Nineveh and there is Joppa the central place where the word of God was going to be presented to the Gentiles way way back there and here's Peter on the threshold of delivering the message of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles Cornelius a non-Jew and this Peter 
is saying, well, I'm not going to go to them. This is the story of the food. That was the, the vision of the food that were on the sheets. Is that, that God was about to say to Peter, the Israelites were likened unto the food that was clean, and the Gentiles were likened unto the food that is not clean, not part of God's covenant. And so he has this vision three times in likening unto the three men that were going to come to Peter the, the following the hours or whatever that preceded this vision. And Peter is being taught by the Lord that I'm opening up the whole of repentance world, the whole of the kingdom of God to the whole entire world through Jesus Christ. And this unclean people, the Gentiles, are now going to be having a covenant relationship with me. And we in this room fulfill this vision. If Peter had said, no, I'm not going to do it, we haven't got a story to tell. But Peter listened, as did Jonah, but we've got the same location. From Joppa, he heads the wrong way, he repents and goes on to Nineveh, and here he goes from Joppa to Caesarea to teach and tell them about the word of God. Then it says, Peter opened up his mouth in verse 34, of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecters of persons, but in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word I say ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism of John that John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost, and with power, Jonah was from the region of Nazareth, Galilee, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all the things that he did, both in the land of the Jews and Jerusalem, whom you slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed himself openly, not to all the people, but unto the witnesses chosen before the Lord, even to us, which did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. So these amazing men of God, women and women, of talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, of the impact it would have on all the people of that time. And if we go a bit further, verse 44, while Peter yet spoke these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them which heard the word, and they had the circumcision, the Jews, the clean food, were astonished because as many as Peter, that vision of unclean animal food that was on that sheet coming down from heaven, that God said, eat the unclean, if you like, the Gentile, the non-related people with God, because that on the Gentiles was also poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost, for they heard them speak in tongues and magnify God. This is salvation that we live in. The miracle of repentance was being kept alive here today because of this story that we read of here. The amazing wonder of what God is doing in your life. And if repentance ever becomes um, something that we don't think about, if repentance becomes something in the distant past, the, the, the ten lepers that were healed, nine of them disappear into the pages of history of mankind. We just read and it's, they're buried in the pages of history. But the Samaritan, the stranger, he comes back and falls on his feet and just worships the Lord and thanks him and gives him praise. He says, where are the rest? Are oh, not this just one stranger? Now, if that man stayed repentant for the rest of his life, he will talk about the day he met Jesus. He'll talk of that time. I came back and he said, and I said, and he healed me and he blessed me. And he said, go away, your faith has made thee whole. But the moment repentance becomes the thing of the past, that story dies. And our story dies if we don't keep repentance, the miracle of repentance alive in our heart, the stories that we know of people that have repented and their lives have been changed because it started here in the book of Acts chapter 10. Same place, Joppa. Caesarea, Nineveh, Jonah, whatever he did, he did. He repented later on, I'm sure. It's one of the great books. Let's look in Matthew chapter 10, chapter 12, nearly finished. Matthew chapter 12. And it says here, the Pharisees, the religious people, were asked for a sign. 
And he wasn't really particularly wanting to help them along the way because they were so proud and they weren't repentant. But he answered and said in verse 39, An evil and adulterous generation seek after a sign. There shall no sign be given unto you but the sign of the prophet Jonah. What was his sign? For Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly. There you go, it's a whale. So, so, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, dead. He died for you and I. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonah, so Jonah is here. So here is Jesus saying, using the story of Jonah to, to highlight and to illustrate the power of the kingdom of God to those that repent. And we have made that our lives haven't we all of us here today our lives is to talk about the kingdom of God and we can do that in our repentance state if you're here first time or been travelling along for you it starts behind the curtain in the waters of baptism that's where it starts you've, you've kind of repented to get here repentance is action as well come and get baptised here this afternoon and know the Lord and all the people said we're going to have a time of prayer now, so we've got to pray.